Good morning. Good morning. Someone gave me a look when I came in at 11.29 and sorry, probably 11.31. It was that woman in front of me there. Sort of went, you're the speaker, what are you coming on at this time for? Do you hear me? What, she, said, she gave me a look that said, you're the speaker, why are you coming at this time? And it's because, it's because I couldn't find my shoes. I was in the house of my own and somebody has tidied up behind me. Um, I knew exactly where they were. They were near the front door where I'd taken them off. I'm usually a tidy sort of fella, but I knew, and I had them ready to go. And I came down, I'm thinking, a couple of minutes, takes me down the road and the shoes aren't there. And I had to go and look for them. Where would they put them? Oh. So I found my shoes, thank goodness. You can't smell my feet through them. And uh, do you know what? If you're looking for your mess today, your sin, do you think you're going to tidy up or do something about it? You're not going to find it. It's all been dealt with at the cross, taken away. It's not there. If you put your trust in Christ, you don't have to clean up after yourself. He cleans up after you. Uh, he, has he has incredible things to say to us this morning. Let's read together in John chapter 14, words you'll know very well. The first words of John chapter 14. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. <clears throat> trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you are going, so how, how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Let's pray together. Father, <clears throat> make our thoughts shallow enough this morning and simple enough so that we can understand them and yet make them as deep as deep can be so that we want to look more and more and more into them. We'll probably just stick our toes in the edge of the ocean this morning and yet we could wade out into the depths, the incredible depths that not even in today's world with all their equipment they can they can reach at the bottom of the sea. And so, Lord, open up a door for us today where we're hungry for you and hungry for Jesus and take away all the other hungers that we think we have and just focus our appetite on him. 
We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just <clears throat> let me just read you something first. These words we have just read, <clears throat> John chapter fourteen, verse one to three. The three verses we have just read are rich in precious truth. For eighteen centuries, they have been particularly dear to Christ's believing servants in every part of the world. Many are the sick rooms which they have lightened. Many are the dying hearts which they have cheered. We have first in this passage a precious remedy against the old disease. That disease is trouble of the heart. The remedy is faith. Heart trouble is the commonest thing in the world. No rank or class or condition is exempt from it. No bars or bolts or locks can keep it out, partly from inward causes and partly from outward, partly from the body and partly from the mind, partly from what we love and partly from what we fear. The journey of life is full of trouble. Even the best of Christians have many bitter cups to drink between grace and glory. Even the holiest saints find the, wor find the world a veil of tears. Faith in the Lord Jesus is the only sure medicine for troubled hearts. To believe more thoroughly, trust more entirely, rest more unreservedly, lay hold more firmly, lean back more completely. This is the prescription which our master urges on the attention of all his disciples. No doubt the members of the little band which sat round the table at the Last Supper had believed already. They had proved the reality of their faith by giving up everything for Christ's sake. Yet what does the Lord, their Lord say to them here? Once more he presses on them the old lesson, the lesson with which they first began. Believe. Believe more. Believe distinctly in me. Let me open this at the start of this book. Let me read you these words, first published in 1873, 150 years ago. What's changed in the world? And I, and I know there's all sorts of denominations out there, and, and you might think <clears throat> little of the Church of England at times, but that was written by Bishop J.C. Ryle. A man of God who knew what the remedy for our heartache is and pointed us then 150 years ago to those words that we we've, we've just read I think it's incredible the cure for your heartache has not changed medicine changes all the time I work on a ward where Every ward in the hospital has, has, has pharmacists running around it. And down below on the bottom floor, there must be hundreds of pharmacists putting prescriptions together. And then there's a guy who goes around the wards all day long, lifting prescriptions, leaving them back. And if you're in hospital and they say you're going home today, but we just need to get your prescription up. Don't think that somebody walks down and puts it into someone and they say, right, sort that and take it up. Take it up. You could be five hours before they bring it up to you. So order your lunch if they tell you you're going home in the morning. Order your tea. You might need that medicine. But there's thousands of different medicines for millions of different conditions. You know what? We're not getting any better. My wife, who works in NA, just said to me the other night, and she was on night shift. She said, Jane said, 
and she's just back to work after a spell of sickness, you know how she is, but and she went in and it's the end of June and she's thinking it's gonna be not so hard a night and she said to me on the phone, It's like the middle of winter here. The only way they have the winter problems and always the big winter push of so many people being sick. Well that's now just right through the year. Sin is a terrible thing. Sickness in this world was caused by sin. And believe you me, with all the science and everything, thank the Lord for all those people that do all the research and all the stuff that can save lives and prolong life and help people with chronic illnesses. But the numbers are just increasing. We need a deeper cure. George Bernard Shaw once said that the statistics, I think it was George Bernard Shaw, the statistics of death are very impressive. One out of every one people die. And I don't know when he said that, but it was a long time ago and the statistics have not changed. The statistics until the Lord comes back will not change. Every single person in this room will have a date that they will die on and it is set by God that that will happen. The question is, are you ready for it? I have a great love of stuff. Tim's always shown me cars and he's he wanted to change his car, and since he kept sticking all these cars in front of me, I've started looking at used cars NI. You believe you me, they, they look like the price of them, they look like they're new cars NI, but they're used cars NI, and I'm just dreaming about them sometimes, but I'm not going to change my car. But, but I love stuff. And the other thing I like, and I've moved house too many times, is I, I, love, I love architecture and I love looking at property. And it's only stuff. It's all going to go. Do you know what Jesus loved? He never owned a house. I don't know if he ever had a chariot or a cart. He certainly didn't own a Ferrari. No, it wasn't Ferraris I was looking at, by the way. But uh, He didn't own a fancy car. He didn't own a house. He had nowhere to put his head sometimes. In fact, the very night he was born, there was nowhere for him to put his head, only a stable. But I'll tell you who he loved. And the fact that God sent for shepherds the night that he was born shows that he had the heart of God because he, he loved people. And God also sent for kings on that night so he loved all people of all categories and you know who he came to save he came to save the lowly the shepherd and he came to save the elite the kings they love people that's what you are by the way just people you're here in your body and I, I recognize most of you because you're here in your body, but he's interested in your heart. One day you're going to leave that body and the bit that lives inside there called your soul will live forever. Do you be a provision for that? It's God's heart that you do. He loves... He loves bringing people into his family. Curtis... Curtis didn't have his glasses with him and he did better than I'm doing and I have mine but God wants to be your father he loves his children and he and he just wants to bring them home Timothy is 18 he left home yesterday to go to Cape Reed Bible School for a week 
I spent all day yesterday hovering about the house waiting on messages to see where he was and had he made it through Manchester, did he meet his friend, did they go into Manchester, did they get stabbed while they were in Manchester. Did, I had all these thoughts, I was just, I couldn't settle until he said I'm on the train to Carnforth. I thought, oh great, let me know when you're in Carnforth. Two and a half hours later he hadn't told me he was in Carnforth, let me know when you're in Camry. And then I got a message, sorry, I arrived in Cape Henry 15 minutes ago. Well, I'll tell you what, there were only 15 minutes to him, but those extra 15 minutes were like an eternity to me. And he's an adult, seemingly, but that's my baby. I felt the same when Peter left home. I felt the same with all of them. And God doesn't worry like us. He's almighty, but he has a concern for your soul. Friday, Timothy will come home. Probably when he starts his journey on Friday, I'll I'll have the same old hovering feeling until he's home. Safe in the house. He told me yesterday I'm in Cape Ray. I'd say, relax, that's right. They'll take care of him. God loves people. Do you know what? Jesus only had 12 close disciples. He had lots of other people that got caught up. In the, in the entourage, if you like. But he only had 12 close disciples. And I find that incredibly interesting. The God of all the universe came to save the world, but he only got three men or 12 men close to him. And one of the reasons I think when you read this passage and it starts in chapter 13 and works its way right through to chapter 17 you get to know those people John knew them very well by the way and John has John's gospel is incredible in that he writes it sometime after some incredible come um, quite a amount of time after he's the last man standing who was with Jesus he writes it with perspective and he talks about the people he was with uh, and, and in these passages he, he, he sort of lets you know them a wee bit and I only noticed yesterday that when I was reading chapter 13 that he, he talks about Peter as always talks about him as Simon Peter and I don't know if that's John having a go at Peter saying <laughs> You're Peter now, you know, at this stage, you know, later on in life, you you are the great Peter. But you know what? There was the old guy called Simon. Jesus gave you a new name, Peter. But when I mention you in my gospel, I'm going to mention you as both. There's still the old and the new. And Jesus is always working in your life. Let me read you chapter 13, start of chapter 13. Give you some of God's heart. This is Jesus Read chapter 13 with me. It was just before the Passover. Passover feast. And Jesus knew that that's when they slaughtered the lamb so that people would so that the people would be released from slavery in Egypt. And that's when his moment was going to be. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Because Jesus loves people. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to to betray Jesus. There's the first of the twelve. John gives us an insight that he could only have told us afterwards because it hadn't yet happened. And he's looking back at the situation and he's saying the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And yet, next word, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. His return journey was not in doubt. 
So what did Jesus do with all that knowledge and all that power at his fingertips? So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And now we come to Peter. But look what John calls him. He came to Simon Peter, <laughs> the old, becoming the new. He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, you are, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. Jesus loves people. Do you think... Do you think that these were easy people to love? Been with him for three years. He knows all things. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. And someone in something I read yesterday said they had looked at every translation of the Bible I never found one that said Judas left the room before Jesus washed their feet. No, he was there. Jesus loves people. Right up to the moment Judas left the room to go and betray Jesus. And even after that, before he went out and hung himself, he could have repented and came and thrown himself before Jesus. There was forgiveness even for that. Jesus loves people. Were they easy to love? I loved some people one time and I found out <laughs> through accident <laughs> that they didn't really love me. And uh, I tell you what, it cut me right to the heart. Jesus kept on loving these people. He really loves you. You let him down this week. Do you know what? His love for you does not diminish at all because of that. In fact, it should say to you, come to me, says Jesus, because I died for that very stuff that you think that you're going to put right before you come to me. No, just come to me with it. And Peter, Peter's been with him three years. Simon, Peter. Still growing in his faith, still getting to know Jesus, still thinking that he knows more than Jesus and Jesus knows everything. Do you think he was easy to love? Do you ever think Jesus felt sometimes like saying, Oh, Simon, I'm not going to even call you the rock anymore. I'm just going to call you Simon again. Would you just shut up? That's the sort of person I would have been with that sort of person around me. And I, and I tried to love them, I tried to love them, I tried to love them. They just say, would you just go away? Jesus didn't. He loved them. To the end, having loved his own in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love or that he loved them to the end. Just last week I buried my uncle. I said up here he was more than an uncle to us and then George was talking to Bethany and George mentioned to Bethany that, that my uncle had died and Bethany said she never knew him. Well that is true but I'll tell you what, he lived in Fermanagh, we are a vast family, we can't get to know him, we can't be each other all the time but she knew he existed but she never met him. I, well she did actually meet him, she just doesn't remember but... Uh, 
But back in the day when I was growing up, he was my superhero. He was only six years older than me. When we went to visit my grandmothers and there were six of us, and in the early days we lay on a mattress on the, on the floor, toe to toe, three at the top, three at the bottom. My mum and dad in the bed sat he beside us and maybe one or two of the wee ones climbed in beside them. That's how it was. And there was a dry toilet and somebody had to empty it. There was no electric so you had to light a gas lamp and this is in the 1970s and uh, there was no running water and you had to go to a well for mana is still it was back there in those days and it, it's it's full of mansions now but and I was at my uncle's funeral the other day and I was remembering the things he did for us and he and because we used to sleep all in that room together when Stephen and I got up a bit, my brother. He converted. He had great hands on and became the best known joiner in County Fermanagh. And uh, he converted an old transit van into a bedroom for us. He panelled it out. This is long before you kids had your fancy camper vans. This, this was this guy. This, so he, he, he run this old scrap. Ford Transit into the hedge and he he, 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 he panelled it out and he put a big mattress in it for us and we used to go out there and play Monopoly and all sorts of things then we slept out there with torches and all that it was super cool he prepared a place for us and, and I was driving the other morning and I knew he was so ill a couple of weeks ago and all I could pray was Lord make sure that Nigel has made provision for that room that you prepared for him. Nothing else mattered. And I started to think of the people and the men in my life. I started to think of my uncle. I've talked before about my dad. I, I believe he's in heaven. He trusted Christ. That's all you need. My father's house are many rooms. Trust in God, trust also in me. Do you want to get home? He says, yeah, I'd like to get home for lunch. But Do you want to get home, home to heaven? Jesus loves people. He doesn't just wash feet. He calms troubled hearts. Do not let your hearts be troubled. There's a remedy for heart trouble. Let me read you a list of my troubles. Do you want to know? There's a spectrum of my troubles. So we'll start at the start of the spectrum. Where are my glasses? Has anyone saw my glasses? Because I can't see them right now because I need to have them on to see them. And I lose my glasses. That's triviality, right? My car. Does, does anybody notice if anybody hit the side of my car? Or just whatever. My house. These are the things that trouble us. For you younger people and for some of you older people, my phone, my phone, my, my new vital organ called my phone. It's 5%. I'm going to die. My data has almost run out. My internet speed. Young people have a whole new set of troubles. My internet speed, my job, let's get on to solider ground, my family, my children, my colleagues, my wife, my mum, my in-laws, my uncle, my brother, my sisters, my health, my aches and pains, my head, the trouble that goes on in there, and all of you have that trouble running around your heads day after day. And then there's my world, the news that I hear every night of the troubles across the world. And a wee while ago it was COVID, and now it's wars and the economy 
and the price of living, oil, gas, electric, rates, petrol, diesel, etc., 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 and it's all enough to drive you mad. Heartache. And that's nothing compared to what you, if the Holy Spirit is working in your life right now and he's convicting you of sin and your heart is troubled about that. Even over that, your eternal well-being, Jesus says one thing only. Do the days of the week, okay. Sunday, do. Monday, not. Tuesday, let. Wednesday, your Thursday, heart. Friday, be. On Saturday, trouble. Do not, if you want to remember, think of seven, seven words that can change your life. Do not let your heart be troubled. What do you mean, Jesus? And these disciples that he's just spoken to, and he's just told them, guess what? The biggest guy among you, the guy that you think's your leader, I've just told them, then Jesus said to Peter, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times, and there's no gap in the manuscript. It doesn't say a big 14 or any heading. It just says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You big bunch of failures. Don't worry about it. I've got it covered. Trust in God. Yeah, we do that. I was down on the beach this morning. Bally Albert Beach is underrated. Bally Walter Beach is overrated. Yeah, there's more sand at Bally Walter Beach and you could walk for miles at most of the time of the day. But go down there this morning when the tide is almost in and all those stones along the beach in front of my house, my beach. Uh, I, I love going down there just when the tide's right. I like it when, when there's a bit of sand to walk on to. But when the tide's right in, there's something you don't hear in Bally Walter Beach. And as the, the waves come in and about every third or fourth, fifth wave is a big wave and it hits the stones and then you hear it crackling through the stones as it goes back out. Why did God invent a noise like that just to make me feel good? It's amazing. That's God. I look at the sky, it's just vast, unending. I look at the sea and there's just so much of it I couldn't imagine how many gallons there are. That's God. Yeah, I trust him. Jesus says, trust also in me. I'm about to do something for you guys that will just make eternity perfect for you. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go in my father's house or many rooms. If it were not so, do you think I'd have told you that? I've never lied to you guys. There's loads of rooms in my father's house. So there's one for every single one of you. <coughs> Just have to make your reservation through Christ. Well, when we get there, will, there, will it be a doer-upper? No. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Well, how do you find your way? Well, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. And as for every single man that was ever in my life, and I thought about my uncle and his dad before him, my granddad, and I was talking about my mum to my mum about this recently, and I said, I, I, I don't remember granddad out of his pajamas, and I don't remember him smiling, mum. And she said, you know what? He was just racked with pains. I don't remember my granddad putting me on his knee and jiggling me up and down. He, he just, if he wasn't in bed, he was out of bed getting something to eat and then in his pajamas and back to bed. 
I know what she told me. She told me that he was racked with pains. And he lived for the next painkiller to try and douse the pain in his body. How did that happen? Well, when he was a boy back in County Fermanagh, back in his day, there, and, and right across this country, by the way, there were work, what were called hiring fairs. And if you were poor, poor, you took your son along to the hiring fair and you took the biggest bid for him on that day and he maybe went away for months and worked for someone and he got his bed and board and you didn't have to pay to feed him. And that's how my granddad met my grandmother. He went to work for a big house and she was in the kitchen. But he was out labouring and he worked all day in whatever the weather was. And if it was pouring rain, he had no change of clothes. And he had to sleep in those damp, rotten, wet clothes and get up and work in them the next day. And my grandmother met him and she used to try and dry the clothes in the kitchen until the, the head of the kitchen chased my granddad and told him to get his wet, dirty clothes out of there. And he had to get into them again. So he lived in wet Dirty clothes all his life, and when he had got to 60-something, the pain of rheumatism just killed him. Did Jesus understand my granddad? Well, I'm assured that by my mum that my granddad put his trust in Jesus Christ. Did Jesus understand what sort of man he was? Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. He took the very nature of a servant and as I read John 13 yesterday and I saw Jesus down on his knees washing the servant the the disciples feet the lowest of the low servant I thought wow you know what my granddad went through you loved him And you saved him. And it didn't matter that he was way down there and the person that owned the house was way up there. Both of them needed you, Lord Jesus. The man in my life. Peter lives in Bath. He got... He he lost his accommodation, not through his own fault, but he had to go look for a place and the price of rooms was just ridiculous and he went on to a website that says room to spare and all the rich people in Bath have big houses with with uh, bits underneath them you know what I mean and uh, they turned those into rooms for people to stay in so Peter eventually got a room and all I could think was Lord as I prayed about my uncle and about different men in my life I'm glad he got that sorted out, but Peter, if you're listening to this, get the room sorted out in heaven. Book your place. All of you. In my father's house are many rooms. All Jesus ever came to do was to introduce you to his father by paying the price for your sin so that you could be able to go near his father and then for you to say, I want to be saved. And you become a child of his father and one day you'll go home and live in his father's house. You don't do that. You don't get home. You're separated from the father forever in hell. All I could think about the other week was... What is eternity like? What's it like when you step over that line? The great unknown. And this uncle who had made a room for me and prepared a room for me, all I could think of, prepared that old van for me, and all I could think of, has he got something prepared for himself? 
I could think of just nothing worse than just stepping over that line into eternity and no preparation made. And, and I see it all the time in hospital, people sitting around beds holding a hand that's about to go. And then that hand that they're holding lets go of their hand because they're gone. And I asked myself this question, was Jesus there on the other side just ready to take hold of their hand? Is he going to take hold of your hand? Are you going to step out into eternity without a hand to hold? Because if you do, it's free fall into hell forever. But if you put your trust in him, when you cross that line, he's there to take your hand. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. I am the way, the truth and the life, says Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the only way. Make sure you get on the only way. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us so much. Nothing else matters. It's people and Jesus. He loved these 12 men so much to teach us a lesson that he could pour his life into 12 men so that they could multiply in that upper room just after he had gone back into heaven to 120. And that 120 would multiply in 40 days' time into 3,000 and then 5,000 more and Endless millions after that have booked their place in heaven, Lord. I pray this morning that the ones I love, the men and the women in my life, my daughters and my wife and my, my mom and my sisters and my brothers and my uncles and my grandparents and my dad and everybody connected with me have booked their place in this wonderful place that you prepared for them, Lord Jesus. Thank you that preparation in preparing something for someone as everything. Lord, thank you that your preparation for this place was to die on a cross for us. And so help us to accept what you paid everything for. In Jesus' name, amen.